in. Let's all stand up together as we begin our service. If you're outside, come on in. Worship is starting. Here we go. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. And he opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. Our God, he holds the victory. And we sing. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, oh, 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 we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from the grave, my God still rolling stones away. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, and accepted, redeemed by his let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the brothers, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Day. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in we shout out your praise, oh, 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 we shout out your praise. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I'm Lynn. I'm part of the worship band here, and we want to welcome all of you this morning in this place. Also, those of you online, we encourage you to fill out a connection card, which you can do in the back seat or online if you're not here. And um, also prayer requests can be done that way. So thanks for joining us. Amen. Thank you, Lynn. We learned a song last week that we're going to, I want to sing the chorus. Kevin, can you get the chorus up there? It goes like this. Oh, your grace so free. I have my pick. Hold on. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Remember this song from last week? Amen. We're going to sing this song this morning. Here we go. Let's try it. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost my 
without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Here's the chorus that we sing together All oh, your grace so free washes over It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Peace from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. All oh, your grace, so free, washes all. It's your is free. We know that it's renewed to us daily. So we come before you this morning. We come and we ask for forgiveness, Lord. We know that we have not measured up to your standard. We know that we deserve punishment for our sins for when we've fallen short. So we come before you corporately as a church together, but also individually as people. 
asking for forgiveness for what we have done or what we have left undone, Lord. We deserve your punishment, but we know that you have made us new because of the blood shed for us on the cross of Calvary. So that this morning we declare freedom. We declare no longer sin and shame, but we declare freedom on an account of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as your brother in Christ, I declare that your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. your voice.
everlasting goodness and mercy because you continue to be good to us day in and day out. We're grateful for that, and we sing of that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. We say together, church, amen. amen. Let's greet one another this morning. Say hello, and then we want to welcome the children to come on down for a, our children's message with Pastor Nathan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, brother. Stay out of the way of golf balls, dude. I saw that. That looks brutal. All right. We want to welcome the kids to come on down. If you are a child or a kid or someone young or a little person, let's get them up here. Pastor Nathan's going to burn the church down, I think. <laughs> we'll be okay. I'll put it back, I promise. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, they're not awake yet. Have you guys had coffee yet? And good morning. Um, we're going to sing a song this morning, and I'll apologize in advance. Um, we're going to sing a song. I'm going to take a page out of Pastor Brad's book. I'm apologizing for me singing, not for the kids singing. You'll like that. Um, and it goes like this. Oh, be careful, little eye, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eye, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. All right, so you guys ready to try it? All right, kids, we're going to do it. And you know what? You guys out there are going to need to help. They're all looking at me. We're going to help. All right, all right. Be careful, little eye, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above, who's looking down with love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. So it's important what we look at. And what we look at affects who we are. See, Jesus says... The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And so that's why I grabbed this candle, because a lamp is what brings things in. And so your eyes are the things that bring the light into your body, or the darkness. And so your eyes... If, if you were to take an, imagine an analogy and think, okay, this is what my eyes are for my body. So this light does to this room what your eyes do for your body. And so whatever you look at is what gets into your body. And so Jesus tells us, think about what you're looking at. Because we can look at all kinds of things, and the things that we look at can either bring darkness into our lives or bring light into our lives. What is the thing that we can look at that will bring light into our lives? Yes. Um, if somebody helps you up. Somebody helps you up. So good things. Yeah, if people do good things, that's really good. Yeah, if somebody does good stuff, that brings light into your life. What else? Your dog. Yes, look at God's creation. Absolutely, that brings light into our lives. God made our creation, and it's good, and it's wonderful. And so when we focus on creation... Uh, that brings light into our lives. Yeah. Like looking at a church, that's very good. When we put ourselves around people that follow Jesus, they can bring light into our lives because we can see the way that they follow Jesus. All right, you got something over here? Family, yeah, absolutely. Family can bring light into your life as well. All right, somebody's got to hit the big one here for me. Light, we look at light. Okay, yes, you know what? We're going to segue. I'm going to pull this one here. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And so we look at Jesus, and we look at Jesus, light comes into our lives. He's ultimately the source of light that makes everything in us healthy. And so let's say a prayer to God and ask that he would help us uh, to look at him and bring light into our lives. And so I'll say a couple words, and you guys say them after me, all right? 
Dear God, God, thank you for Jesus, Jesus, who is is the light of the world. world. Help me me to focus focus on him, him. that my life life may be full of your light. light. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. All right, you guys can head on out uh, to Children's Church with Miss Jen. Thanks for coming up. Thank you for your good answers. Oh, parents, if you haven't checked them in, please go check them in. We'd like to give them back. The bridge has these words here that, uh, that for some are problematic, and I was reminded of uh, Pastor Nathan's message last week. We talk about sometimes we limit the Holy Spirit. Um, denominations like Lutherans, Baptists, Presbyterians, we always talk about the Holy Spirit, but it's always as an afterthought. The name of the Father and the Son, oh, and the Holy Spirit. It even has an and. But I think sometimes we, 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 we box in what the Holy Spirit is in our lives, and we have to be reminded that he was a wonderful gift, that when Jesus rose and he went up to heaven, he was going to give us his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is powerful in our lives, and we have to be reminded of that. And so when this bridge says, when I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down, we have the authority. We declare that because of Jesus Christ in our lives and because of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Amen? Amen. Here we go. Champion. So hard to see it took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what we don't deserve and you take the broken and raise them to glory you are my champion giants fall when you stand undefeated every battle you've won i am who you say i am you crown me with confidence i am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all now i can finally see it teaching me how to receive it so let all the striving see this is my big
thank you, Lord. We declare victory on an account of Jesus because he has conquered it all, sin and shame and death on the cross as you rose again for us, your children. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. You guys are kind of awake. That's good. All right. Sorry. Uh, first of all, we have no video clips this morning. Um, you know, last few weeks we were doing Life Animated, and I was, uh, during the last sermon, realizing how much I enjoyed being able to watch videos on a Sunday morning and then preach a little bit. And I was like, wow, my sermon's really long this morning. No, it's not. But it felt long because I didn't have video clips to watch. This morning we're kicking off our new series, Winning on Purpose. Um, did you know that, that, that God wants you to win at life? You see, I believe that God wants us to win at life, but, but all too often when we hear that, we think of a prosperity gospel and we start playing by all the wrong rules. Or we start keeping score in the wrong ways. And we start trying to tap into those things that actually are going to steal our life and take our life instead of the things that will give us life. Jesus wants us to win at life. And so that means that we as followers of Jesus are called to focus on the right things, to, to have a purpose and an intent and a, a direction that we're setting our life if we are going to win at it. And so in other words, what this series is about is, is setting the scorecard right and keeping score according to how God would have us play the game rather than by playing the ways of this world. Jesus said in John chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and that you have it more abundantly. And so I want to ask you, how abundant is your life right now? And I'm not talking about all the kids' soccer games and all the things you're supposed to go to and all the things you're supposed to do. I've got an abundance of those too. But does your life feel abundant? Does your life feel full, not in the way of overwhelmed and stressed and anxious, but does your life feel abundant and full of joy and full of the things that, that you want in life? Or does it feel empty? Does it feel like maybe something's missing? Well, maybe you've been keeping score the wrong way. Maybe you've been looking to the wrong things, and maybe you're tapping into these things that are actually taking your life and not giving it to you. I'm going to share with you uh, this quote from a guy uh, named David Foster Wallace. He wrote uh, the most one of the most well-renowned, well-known commencement speeches of all time. And in the middle of this uh, commencement speech at Kenyon University, he had this to say, and, and mind you, as I'm telling you this, uh, David Foster Wallace was not a Christian. This is not the, the quote up there. We can go back to the other slide. This is Cynthia Heimel. I'll give you her in a second. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC, that would be Jesus Christ, or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Four Noble Truth or some inevitable, inviolable set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. Side note, uh, you got a wallet in your pocket this morning or a purse? Do you, nobody came with anything this morning? Okay, so guess what? You're in the 1%. You have more than 99% of the people on this planet. Most of this planet lives with under $2 a day. We have an abundance. And yet somehow the enemy sneaks into our lives and says, you don't have enough. We'll get to that in a moment. Worship your body and your beauty, and you always feel ugly. And when time and age starts showing... You'll die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power and you'll end up feeling weak and afraid and you'll never, you'll need ever more power over others to numb 
you to your own sense of fear. Worship intellect, being seen as smart, and you'll always end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it's that they're unconscious. They are our default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day. Kind of crazy to think about. Another one of those ones that's big in our world today is fame. And, and we have this tendency, especially with social media and the media that's before us, to, to think that, 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 in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, that, that man, if I was famous, if I was, I was well-known, if I, if I was one of those social media superstars, well, then I'd really have everything I'd want. And that's where Cynthia Heimel spoke. You see, she grew up in New York, and she knew a lot of these actors before they became the, the big deal, the thing that they were. And she had this to say. I pity celebrities. No, I do. Celebrities were once perfectly pleasant human beings, but now their wrath is awful. More than any of us, they wanted fame. They worked. They pushed. The morning after, each of them became famous. They wanted to take an overdose. Because that giant thing they were striving for, that fame thing that was going to make everything okay, make their lives bearable, provide fulfillment and happiness, had happened. And they were still them. Nothing changed. And that left them, the delusionment left them howling and insufferable. In other words, they chased after this great thing in their lives, and they got it. And the thing that they were actually seeking wasn't in the thing that they got. This is what I'm talking about, is, is that there's all these things in our lives that, that call for our life, that invite us to find our purpose and our meaning in them. And when we go to these things trying to tap our worth and our value, it's just simply not there. And so the first thief that I want to talk about this morning is scarcity. The primary message of this world is one of scarcity. There is not enough time, money, love, or security. And so we spend our lives trying to get these things, never being able to have them. Just have to ask any middle child. We search for these things. We want these things, and, and they always seem to be just out of grasp. And yet Jesus had a different message for us. Not a, a message of scarcity, but a message of abundance. Jesus said to his disciples and to us, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or your body about what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? We have an abundant creator, a, a, a creator that owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he says, I will provide for you. I have everything in my hands. You will lack for nothing. And yes, we may experience lack in our lives, but we have a God that can provide us with anything we need at any time. And yet we live in a world where everybody's chasing after stuff. And Jesus simply invites us to trust. To trust that he will provide. To trust that he has enough for us. To invite us out of that scarcity mindness, mindset and always being worried about getting what we need and put our worth and our value and our trust in him, knowing that he will provide. See, this is a kingdom way of thinking, a kingdom way of, of looking at the world. And, and Paul thinks in the same way about this same sort of kingdom logic. He says, and, and as he's writing these words, I want you to know that, that Paul is sitting in jail on his way to Rome, on the way to, to be tried, having no idea what the future is going to hold. He writes these words 
to the saints in Philippi. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. With thanksgiving, present your requests. Isn't that usually the the opposite way of things work? Somebody gives us something and then we say thank you? What Paul is actually saying here is when you come to God, say thank you on the front end. In other words, trust, believe that you have a good and loving father and he's not going to give you something that will be harmful for you. He's going to give you the best, even if you don't believe it or trust it. He's saying, come to me knowing that I have an answer already. Have you ever had one of those things come up in your life where you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to be terrible, this is going to be awful, I don't know what's going to happen, and you're just all tied up. And then the thing happens, and then you come out the other side and you're like, you know, that wasn't so bad. You know, God had something in store in mind for that all along, and I spent all that time worrying and fretting and being anxious and being upset, and yet God already had it all planned out ahead of time. Paul continues, and I'm going to show you one of the verses that's most often taken out of context here and show you the right context. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. You catch what he said there? I mean, oftentimes we look at Paul and we think of Paul as this incredible spiritual giant that just always had things always figured out. But what did he say there? I have learned to be content. And what is the secret to being content? Jesus. See, that's the real context for there is when you're going through stuff in life, the secret to getting through it is Jesus. Oftentimes we, we stamp that ber- verse on a t-shirt or on a coffee mug or on a gym wall and we look at the squat rack and we start walking up to it, I can do all things, That's the wrong context. The context is, is when you're going through struggle, when you're going through something tough in life, hang on to Jesus and stop looking at the other stuff. That's getting through things. That's doing all things through him who gives you strength. It's finding your meaning and your purpose and your value in Jesus and not in the stuff that's weighing you down. That's what that's about. That's the secret. That's how you can be content no matter what is happening in your life is knowing that Jesus holds for you more than you could ever imagine or ask for. Okay, throw that next slide up there to remind me to do the disclaimer. I put this in the slide deck to remind me to pause and to talk to you for just a moment. And the reason I need to talk to you is I need need to pause and say, I am talking to you not as an American, uh, but as a follower of Jesus. And the reason I wanted to pause and do this is because I don't like the next slide either. But this is the truth, and this is probably one of the most pernicious thieves that we deal with here in America. See, the second thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy are my rights. The American culture is so egocentric about rights, it scarcely needs to be argued. And every culture tainted with even the smallest dose of Western enlightenment and thought, it takes for granted that each person has basic human rights. And I want to share uh, some of this uh, from an author. This is from a book called The American Mind Meets the Mind of Christ. Everyone has these basic rights, the rights to education, the right to health care, the right to tote a gun, the right to death with dignity, the right to vote, the right to worship or not, the right to own and sell property, the right to sue big business and win, 
the right to dream, the right to be free, and even the right to be right, even when I am wrong, and to have others compelled to agree that I am right. Isn't that what our culture kind of is? We've got minorities and majorities. We've got people of every stripe and persuasion screaming about their rights. But what about my rights? And here, I think this is one of those unconscious things in our lives because it's something that, that, that trounces up or jumps up in our head all the time. It's just the way we're conditioned to think. When somebody cuts us off in traffic, when somebody swings their cart in front of us in the grocery line, when your child, when you're trying to serve them dinner, won't answer the question, I have the right that you should pay attention to me and you should listen to me. What about my rights? And all of us, all of us feel angered and upset when people don't pay attention to our rights. And if you look for meaning and value and purpose here in your rights, you're always going to be upset because someone's always going to be running over your toes all the time. And if you're focused on your rights and what you deserve, we live in a broken world and it's always going to be slipping out of your hands always going to be upset. And so Jesus has a different response. Instead of seeking your rights and your own kingdom, he says to us, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, you who bear the name of Christ you are to be about his kingdom and bringing his righteousness into this broken world. You are an image bearer of your creator. And as an image bearer of the creator, you have the right and the responsibility to serve that creation, to do the things that he does in the world. In other words, your life is to be about serving creation and serving your neighbor. It's not rights given to us by an almighty creator, but blessings freely bestowed, gifts freely given. As the psalmist said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And so we, as God's people, are invited to rejoice in the blessings that he gives us, whatever they might be, and stop pursuing our rights, and worrying about our rights. Can we get that slide up there? So we're to serve creation and live for the good of the neighbor. Usually, Pastor Brad and I actually quote Luther a lot, but most of us never put him up on the screen. Uh, so I want to share this quote from Luther to, to let you know that I'm not out in la-la land here when I talk about our rights. A Christian Lutheran says should be dis so disposed that he will suffer every evil and injustice without avenging himself. Neither will he seek legal redress in the courts, but have utterly no need of temporal authority and law for his own sake. To put it simply, as a Christian, you have no right to claim your own rights. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said in the Sermon on the Mount, do not resist evil. I told you I didn't like this slide. This is hard stuff. And it's entirely opposite of everything that we know about our American culture and what our culture says we should do. Our culture says we should stand up for ourselves, that she would defend ourselves, and we get excited about movies that are about defending ourselves. But Jesus says that's not how life should be for you. And if you live your life like this, you're going to end up losing your life. 
Not because you're going to die, but because you're always going to be upset, always going to be offended, and it's going to steal the abundant life that Jesus wants for you. I'm not saying this is easy. In fact, this is hard. And I thought, do I really want to talk about this? Can we go back to Moana? On the contrary, we as, as Christians, however, are called to stand up for the rights of others. To, to wa- gladly, willingly suffer everything for the sake of someone else whose rights are being trampled, someone else who's being taken advantage of, someone else who is suffering. But not for ourselves. Luther continued on um, saying this. Why can't I, in response to something saying, why can't I take up you know, the sword for myself. Why can't I defend myself? Because I can do it without falling into sin. I can do it without taking advantage of others. And he had this to say. Next slide. Oh, we lost the slide. I got it in the book. He said, you may ask, why may I not use the sword for myself for my own cause, so long as it is my intention not to seek my own advantage, but to punish evil? Answer, such a miracle is not impossible, but very rare and hazardous. In other words, you might be able to pull off standing up for yourself and not become the villain that you detest but it's gonna be very hard. You run the risk of when you stand up for your rights, you're going to run over someone else. That, That when you're offended by someone else and so you say you can't say that because I'm offended, now they're offended. And so Jesus invites us in a world that is is full of people clamoring about their rights to simply not play the game. To not be part of the madness of pursuing our own rights. And the third and final thief is the I. And granted, I'll give you this as sort of a a catch-all, but I think it helps us understand well the things that can steal life from us and how they get into us. As I read to the kids earlier, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What are you focusing on with your eyes? What is grabbing your attention? There there is a gravitational pull to whatever we choose to focus on in our lives and that we will become like those things. We become like the things that get our attention. And and whatever we have our attention on is, is what we become like and what we ultimately look like in our lives. So what are you focusing on? What are you looking at? Are they things that give life? Are they things that take life away from you? Jesus' invitation to his disciples then and now is to keep our eyes wide open in wonder, belief, and gratitude. Focusing on what gives life and shunning what takes it. See, we become like the things we pay attention to. So if you're to look at what you're focusing on in your life, what are you going to become like? What shape is your life taking by the things that have your attention? I close with these words from Paul in Colossians.
when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. In other words, what he's saying is, is you were born into the ways of the world and you lived in those ways of the flesh and now all of that has been nailed to the cross and you've been made alive in Christ Jesus, given new life and new purpose and new identity in him. Therefore, don't go back to those things. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Victory is ours through the cross. All the other things that the world would say is great, Jesus says, no, they're not. This is what's great, that I gave my life for you and have made you part of my family. Paul continues, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. When you're looking for worth, when you're looking for value, when you're looking for meaning and purpose and the abundant life, look to Jesus. Don't tap into the things down here to find meaning and value and worth. When the world is running over your rights, Jesus would say, let them. Don't look to those things for value and worth. Your value and worth is sealed in me. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So stop trying to make your life here. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Your vindication is with Jesus. And one day, this Jesus who died on the cross for you, who rose from the dead for you, is going to come back and he's going to set everything right. And you are going to rule and reign with him. That's your worth. That's your vindication. That is your life. And that is what is in store for you as one who believes and trusts in Jesus. So when you face trouble, when you face hardship, when you face someone running over your rights, when you face these things that come up in front of you and say, find your value, find your worth here, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus who went to the cross for you, who's coming back for you, who will raise you from the dead and find your worth and your value there. And then you can embrace whatever life throws at you, knowing you are held in the hands of Jesus, and he has it for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, it's so tempting and so easy to try to tap into meaning in all the ways of this world. But you've reminded us, invited us, encouraged us to find our worth and our meaning and our value in you alone that whatever life might throw at us, our lives might be secure in you. We try and find our lives and all those other things, we'll lose it. But if we lose our life in you, and for the sake of your kingdom, we'll find it. Gracious Lord, give us life. Help us to seek after your kingdom, that your kingdom may come among us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's all stand together, church. As we, um, we come before the Lord in a word of prayer, as we pray for um, our, church, our church this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and we thank you, Lord, 
Father, we thank you for, um, for having a wonderful church here in St. Matthew, Lord, where we can make an impact in our community. And we pray, Lord, that as we continue to carry your mission, Lord, here in, in Rockland and in Roseville and in this area, Lord, may you continue to anoint us in a mighty way, Lord, to bring restorative hope of Jesus to all who are lost. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we, we pray for all of those who are sick, Lord. Uh, we know that there's many people that are struggling with different illnesses. Some of them are prolonged, that they live with illness day in and day out. Others, it's something that's come on into their lives all of a sudden. And so we pray for them, Lord. We pray for uh, Marcel, we pray for Bruce, and we pray for Bonnie this morning, Lord. Uh, you know their ailment. You know where they're hurting, Lord. Lord, we pray that you touch them in a mighty way. Lord, we know that you are a healer. We know that you're the great physician, and you continue to heal. And so we ask, Lord, that you continue to heal these people who are struggling. And all those who may not be struggling in physical ailments, Lord, those that struggle with things of anxiety, Lord, uh, things that are, that are in the mind, things that, that, um, that, that they struggle with, Lord, we pray for that as well. It's very prevalent in our church and in society, Lord, that many people are dealing and carrying burdens that, that, that affect them emotionally in a negative way. And so this morning we pray that you continue to help those people find the help they need, maybe by a professional or maybe through a pastor or maybe through a friend. But we do pray for those that struggle of mental health, Lord, this morning. We pray them, Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we do lose people in our lives from time to time, and, and losing someone that we love is never easy. And so, Lord, um, this morning we pray for the family of Pat, who are mourning, Lord. We know that was a very difficult loss. And so, Lord, there are others that, uh, that have lost people in the last few months or in this past year. And so we pray for them, Lord, who are mourning. It's never easy. And we know, though, that you will provide comfort in the right time. Not only you, Lord, but fill those people that are mourning with people around them that will love on them, that will care for them, that will help them carry the burden that is losing someone they love. So, Lord, we lift that up to you this morning. Lord, in your mercy. And, Lord, as we enter into political season, Lord. Things are so divided in our society. We pray, Father, that you continue to uh, provide guidance to those who are in our government, that those that make decisions and policies that affect our lives every day. Lord, we don't pray for any one political party, but we pray that your will continues to be done in our lives. And so, Lord, we pray for those that are in, that are in charge, the praise those that are in leadership, Lord. May you bless them, Lord. May you bring good people around them to make decisions that are good for our society, for our lives. And so we pray for them. And so we pray for our government. And we pray for um, all the institutions, schools, hospitals, um, social services of all kinds. We pray for them. And so, Lord, in your mercy. And Father, this morning as a church, we come before you and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Please be seated, church. Well, we're so glad that you're with us today. If you don't know who I am, my name is Marco. I'm the worship director here at St. Matthew. And, um, and as you know, today is kind of a special day because uh, after lots of prayer and um, a focus group, we decided that it was important for us to add a third service once a month. So it's a little lighter in here, but there is actually another service that has started in the next door. And that's going to be um, once a month um, we're going to do that at 1045, so I will kind of be the liturgist and kind of close up the services 
when we don't have pastors because we have to juggle that. So if you're wondering why I'm doing this, it's because of that this morning. So uh, we do pray for Pastor Nathan. And believe it or not, there's a 60 plus people over there. So we can rejoice with that this morning. Um, we felt that there was a constituents of our, of our population that needed that late service. So we're trying it out. We'll see how it goes. But if you're with us today, we're glad that you've joined us. Uh, we do want to talk about our offering moment. Offering, guys, is not just another announcement. It's a part of our worship. It's part of what we do. We do it out of obedience because the Lord has called us. We can never outgive God. And our church has been so blessed um, by generous people. And the reason why we have this building, the reason why it's air conditioned, the reason why the children have beautiful classrooms and we're able to do two services like this is because of your generosity. So thank you for continuing to give to the Lord. Um, we're working on a lot of projects, impact projects. Over on the other side, we did an organ relocation of speakers. We expanded the choir loft. We're working on changing the lighting in here so it doesn't look like factory lighting. There's a lot of wonderful things that are in the works, and that is because of your generosity and your faithfulness to our church. And not only that, we continue to partner up with many organizations. Uh, I know we have, uh, the, um, we have Feed My Starving Children coming up in uh, October, and we also have the golf tournament for Acres of Hope. So lots of things going on in our church, and that's, that, I want you to know that it's because of your generosity. So there's many ways to give. You know what those are. I'm not going to say them all this morning, but let's pray for our offering this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord. You are a generous God, and you continue to give us and provide us with so many things out of abundance, Lord. And so, Father, today we lift up our offering. We pray that as we give, we give generously, Lord, knowing that, that you are in control and that we're trusting in you, knowing that you continue to provide. You provide for our church, you provide for our needs, and you provide for our future. So bless our offering this morning, however way we give it, Lord. We ask for a blessing this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. We say together, amen. amen. And last but not least, we have a few things going on. I believe this afternoon there is a family barbecue pool party happening. If you have not reserved, please do that. It's for Club 56, I think. Yes. Is that correct? Club, and I learned what Club 56 <laughs> is. It's fifth and sixth graders, <laughs> Club 56. Bogdan over there is like, is it like a club or something? No. He's like, and I was like, no, it's not like a club. He thought we had like a club in the back that people went back there and clubbed. But it's not like a club. It's just, uh, that's what it's called. So we have that coming up. Next week, we have Brian Hyde coming in. And so we've been working on the endowment fund. And I believe next week, we're going to present him with a $25,000 check that is going to start the endowment fund. And he will be here to answer questions that many of, any of you may have. So that's coming up next Sunday, September 17th. And then next thing after that, um, we have a th uh, in October, we're starting our Red Letter Challenge. We've done this our third year. It's a different one. This year, we're doing a serving challenge. As a church, as a staff, we felt that this was an important challenge for us to have as we continue to learn how to serve, not only be, not only be uh, spectators of, of what we do up here, but also be participators in serving your church. So we're going to do, do that together starting October 1st. And I think that is it. Am I missing anything, ladies? How did I do? I was a little nervous. Awesome. I can sing, but doing this is a whole other world. If I had to sing the announcements, it would probably be way better. But um, we can't do that. I guess we could. Like a musical. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Let's all stand together. Let's, uh, close, in a, let's close in a blessing of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and give you mercy and grace. Um, Father, bless us as we go about our week and all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray and we say it together. Amen. Amen. Here we go. We're close up with House of the Lord. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. You are dismissed, church. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday. Enjoy. Enjoy.